Hello, folks. Oh, this is going to be a journey here. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite artists. And um, especially when I was uh, starting my career um, as a teacher and saw him perform jazz bands and teach jazz bands in the early 70s, um, this was a formidable influence on me. Um, how do you get 14 Grammy nominations? Um, you are the first Japanese national ever to be accepted as a student at Berkeley. You have a NEA Jazz Masters Award. You have a honorary doctorate from Berkeley. And you have recorded hundreds of albums over a 70-year career. And you're not a household name. How is that? Well, maybe because you are a woman in jazz. Maybe that's how it happens. Um, Lil Hardin could say some things about this. At any rate, we got to talk about Tokisho Akiyoshi or Toshiko Akiyoshi, depending on how you might want to pronounce it. She was actually Japanese. Her parents immigrated from Japan to China. And after World War II, let's just say the Chinese unimmigrated them. <laughs> and Japanese were not so welcome in China after World War II. So she and her family were forced out of their home, out of their lives, and sent back to Japan to start over again. And she had been born in China in 1929, in Manchuria, actually, in the northeast province of China. And um, uh, she was a teenager. It was 1945. She's 16 years old. <laughs> and you could have started again. Well, she goes back. And of course, she had classical piano lessons as a kid and the whole thing. But uh, when she went back home, uh, she really had planned to study medicine. That was her desire. That was her passion. And fortunately for us, she met a record collector who knew she played piano and decided to introduce her to some Teddy Wilson. <laughs> And she heard Teddy tickle those keys, and that was it. She was sold on jazz. Yeah, she sold on jazz. And she went, like Japanese tend to do, she went full bore into that jazz, man. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, she's walking around her little town. It was one of those little towns right on the coast there. And uh, it was uh, kind of overrun with uh, soldiers who were there occupying Japan after the war. <laughs> so there was plenty of entertainment houses and things like that. And one day she's walking and she sees a sign uh, in the uh, window of a bar, pianist needed. Well, she was just starting to play jazz, but she played great classical piano and whatnot. So she went in and applied. And I guess the people were not very impressed but after there were a few applicants, uh, they allowed her to come in and try it out with the understanding that her studies were supposed to resume in March and they would be terminating her employment and uh, sending her back to her studies. Well, March came and went. <laughs> and she continued to play piano and entertain all these uh, soldiers that were there. And she gained some notoriety and popularity, but this is off the beaten path. It's not Tokyo or anything. So you're not going to be discovered there. So somewhere around 1952, she had been in Japan now about five years or so. She moves herself to Tokyo and she gets a job playing jazz piano with a little trio, her favorite um, 
uh, performance situation. Uh, either solo piano for her or small group. And usually piano based drums or piano guitar based drums. That's what she loved to do. At any rate, as Norm Grant is coming through with his uh, big jazz at the Philharmonic tour, um, Oscar Peterson comes to the club and goes, oh my God, what is that? And pretty soon, since Norm was his producer, he twists Norm's arm, Norm comes and checks her out, and before you know it, she is now recording her first album. And to make sure it is a success, Oscar lent his rhythm section. Yeah, all of them, Herb Ellis, all the boys. And sir, you all go back up this with Japanese girl. So she had a solid rhythm section, and it was like uh, Tokisho's, uh, uh, Toshiko's piano, and introducing uh, to Toshiko Akiyoshi, and you know, had two different names. And it did pretty well, it introduced her uh, to the world, but uh, uh, she remained in uh, Japan. This is 52, 53, 54. By 55, she's restless. <laughs> I've taught many Japanese nationals. They do not <laughs> rest on their laurels. They do not sit still. They're always pushing forward. So she gets the nerve because she's heard of the great Berkeley School of Music. She gets the nerve to write a letter to the president of Berkeley saying, you need to let me in your institution. And it was more elegant than that, but whatever it was, he was impressed. And so he uh, started the process, and of course the biggest problem he had was fighting the State Department. You're gonna let a Japanese national into our country this soon after the war? And you're gonna let her study at my most prestigious school? Oh no! Well, after a year of wrangling, they made peace. And one day, in the mailbox, is a full scholarship to Berkeley and a one-way plane ticket from Tokyo to Boston. And now this international journey begins. And she makes it to Berkeley, and she is starting to do her thing. Things are going pretty well, but she's a phenomenal pianist and a brilliant musician. And soon she's doing a radio series, and she's got this little gig and that little gig, and then there was this television show called What's My Line on CBS. It was very, very popular when I was a kid. Most of you probably never heard of it. But that gave her national exposure. And so now her American career began. Uh, Berkeley, let's see. Well, Berkeley ended up giving her honorary doctorate in 1998 because she was out of there, man. New York City, here I come. And of course, she's playing, she's doing her thing, and she meets this young sax player, Charlie Mariani, also player. And they start playing together and hanging out, and next thing you know, they're married and have a daughter. And uh, they're having several small groups together, things are going well, uh, but not all that well. And uh, she's also into arranging and composition. And so she forms an association with Charlie Mingus, of all people. Yeah. And she started working with Mingus and even worked that uh, disastrous town hall concert in 1962. Well, I have no idea what was going on between she and Mariani, but I do know that soon after the fiasco at town hall, uh, she left America and went to Japan for three years. So something went sideways and she left. And she came back in 65 and restarted her career. And by 67, she and Charlie were divorced. And she had met another saxophone player 
named Lou Tobacco. And soon, they will be married. They will be married. They had no kids. She had the daughter from Charlie, and they raised that kid. And she's doing her thing. They're playing. He's playing. They're playing together. They have some small groups together, quartets and things like that. Piano, bass, drums, and Lou out front. He's a great sax player, flute player, soprano, tenor, flute. And then they decide to move to California. And once they were there, they kept doing what they were doing, but they had access to studio musicians, the highest caliber musicians in this country. Now, she can compose and she can arrange anything she wants to because she has the firepower among the players to play it. If she can think it, if she can hear it in her heart and mind, these guys will bring it to light. So they formed a band that was called the Toshiko Akiyoshi Lutabakan Big Band. And man, it was great success. Musicianship is so, so high. The first album was called Kogan, which is a Japanese term. <coughs> she always came true to her culture. And the Kogan is um, called a one-man army. That is the translation. And it was written in honor of the Japanese soldier who was lost in the jungles, I think, of the Philippines for 30 years and continued to fight World War II for 30 years. It wasn't until the 70s that he was actually captured and then he still didn't believe that the empire was gone, that the emperor was gone, that the war had been over and everything else. And until he was actually taken to Japan and, and confronted with the reality of it. So their first album was called Kogan in that man's honor. So this started a trend. She is a jazz composer, arranger in the style and in the tradition of Duke Ellington, Charles Mingus, Thad Jones. She likes different woodwind colors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She likes doublings in the woodwinds, flute, clarinet, whatever, piccolo. She likes dense harmony. She likes changes of temperature. She likes all of these things. But additionally, she likes Japanese harmonies. She likes Japanese melodies, and in some of her pieces, she used traditional Japanese instruments that took the music to a total different place. And once again, the musicianship is so high that no matter what they're doing, you're going to be, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. This is a very successful thing to them. Um, one of their most famous albums for me was called Road Time. And there was a tune called Tune Up. It was the only tune I thought I could play with a high school band. That's probably one of the things that worked against her. You could play Basie with a high school band, and Elson with a high school band, and some Thad Jones with a high school band. But boy, you try to play some Toshiko Akiyoshi with a high school band, and there's going to be blood on the walls. That, that, this music is hard. But I could play a little bit of that Tune Up, and that came one of my favorite tunes. You might go check out Road Time, Tune Up. Well, I tune up. It's the first thing on the album. It's a double album. Received a Grammy nomination and all the whole thing. Great, 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 great. Anyway, let's move on. I did that for a while. I think um, seven or eight albums. In the meantime, she's still doing her piano. And she's a brilliant pianist uh, in the style of, say, Bud Powell. Very steeped in the bebop tradition and the whole thing, Teddy Wilson, all those guys, Oscar Peterson, you know, she's got that whole thing down. Um, they decided to move back to New York, and the two of them. Uh, by this time, I think a daughter is maybe 20, 21, 22 years old, and it seems that she decided to stay in California, so the couple moved back to New York, and uh, they started resuming their careers there, and they started another big band of, of, of local New York musicians, top-level jazz musicians, 
uh, maybe not as technically advanced as the guys in California, but most certainly well steeped in jazz. And this band was called the Toshiko Akiyoshi Big Band featuring Lou Tobacco. Uh, he was always the main soloist on uh, flute and uh, saxophones. Uh, in California, they had Bobby Shue and people like that to back him up, but uh, he was the main cat man uh, when they had the New York band. And they did a whole bunch of albums, and they also had a Monday night gig at Birdland uh, for several years. Um, after a while, um, I'm trying to figure about when, uh, maybe uh, uh, 2003 or so, uh, after playing with her piano things and doing the writing and doing this, she became very frustrated because record companies in America would not release her music in America. All of her big band stuff from New York days on, released in Japan. You can probably find some now on CDs, online, thing like that. But during the days when you walked into a store and bought, albums and bought CDs, you couldn't find her stuff yet. And that broke her heart. Uh, she started her own uh, record company called Ad, uh, Ascent. Move me up. And it, it did not work that well for an application. She started going on tour as a solo pianist and in a small group piano situation in order to raise money to support the big band. But after f so many years of that, she just kind of gave up. And uh, in 2003, they played their last concert at Birdland. It was recorded, great album. Uh, they did the same thing in Japan. Last live in Japan. These are two great albums you want to get. Uh, you can find them now. Um, and she said, look, I'm not being treated fairly. My music is not being played here. It's not being sold here. It's just too much of a struggle. I really love playing piano. It is easier. I, I do well. I don't have to do all the management. I don't have to do all the writing and all of that. So I'm going to go back to playing piano. And so eventually the relationship between she and Lou kind of grew apart a little bit. We'll talk about that later. But um, that's what she did. She started just doing her solo piano stuff and um, doing some arranging on the side. But man, the first woman ever to be recognized as an arranger or composer by Downbeat Magazine, which is kind of the sacred organ of jazz aficionados. Her big band dominated the readers' poll and the critics' poll in Downbeat from the 70s to the 80s, despite the fact that it was hard to find her work uh, commercially. You find Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, but you couldn't find <laughs> go tell Shiko Akiyoshi. Huh? Think about that one for a minute. Anyway, um, several Grammy nominations. You know, like I said, NEA Jazz Masters Award, you know, Japan gave her several awards. Man, she has over 50 awards. And she continued to make albums right up until 2019. When she and Lou got together to record her last recording, the two of them. It's called eternal duet. In other words, they are still two musicians and one heart and one musical mind and one musical soul. That's the last one, 2019. You might want to check that out because they are both 90 years old. 90 years old. And yet that love, that passion, and that excellence is clear, even in the album from just a couple of years ago. So here's what I want to say to you. 
Go out and listen to Toshiko Akiyoshi. Listen to her solo piano work. Listen to her work with various trios and quartets. Listen to the work with her various big band aggregations, especially those things where she is integrating Japanese harmonies and melodies and Japanese instruments and that, that smorgasbord of sound and soul. And yet, through it all, the heartbeat of her music is jazz. From the first listening of that album by Teddy Wilson, she became a jazz musician. She wasn't wanted in China where she was born. She was suspect in Japan. She came to America and was accepted by some and shunned by most others, especially the industry folks. And yet, she persevered. And yet, her body of work stands taller than just about anybody. And any woman who's making a living in jazz owes the largest debt of gratitude to one brave little Japanese female born in China in 1929 and is still living with us today at the age of 94 Toshiko Akiyoshi. And now you know the rest of the story. Thank you. <laughs>